With us right now, Ed Crow. Ed, you're found on the web at edcrow.com, and that's K-R-O-W. Uh, Ed, you are a talent transformation expert, and we're going to talk about, uh, well, you've written the book on uh, on strategic HR, uh, but, but I'm excited about, uh, you know, maybe sharing some ideas on how uh, organizations and business owners can create a world-class HR department, how we can empower our HR rather than, I, you know, I like we were just talking before we started recording about instead of, um, you know, treating it like, uh, you know, Toby from the office or he's just like exactly. a <laughs> kind of necessary evil and just kind of shoved into the broom closet or whatever, you yeah. know, that we that we make that HR almost like, a, you know, the, the gateway uh, you know, the, the, the kind of the keystone of our organization, because that's the kind of the, you know, kind of the central place where all the organization, the people of our company, which is, you know, that's the most valuable asset typically right. for, for a company is, is its people. Um, and, and how a lot of that, I think, can, the hub for that can, can stem from HR. I don't know. I'm just kind of uh, yeah, no, opining I, here, <laughs> but uh, I'd love your take on this. You know, it's it's funny that uh, Josh that you mentioned Toby because I reference him in my book. Poor Toby, right? Yeah. And yet, when you look at the when you look at the perception of HR in the media, um, it's it's horrible, and it's probably rightly deserved if we're being honest with ourselves. And so, mm. in my work with clients, um, I, I love working with the executives and the business owners who say, you know what, I need more out of HR and I want and expect more out of HR than just pushing papers around or just telling me what I can't do because it's non-compliant or whatever. I need someone who's going to help me problem solve. And in the, in the course of writing the book, I interviewed a bunch of CEOs and I actually had one gentleman say, Ed, I will never have an HR person in my business ever again. And I'm like, whoa, uh, why is that? And he said, Ed, I, I had someone as I was starting this business up and all she ever did was tell me no. And he said, I'm okay being told no, but you got to come back with a solution. And my mm. experience is HR doesn't bring solutions. And wow. that breaks my heart because um, to me, that's what HR has to embody is, is they've got to be the people who are bringing solutions to the table with regards to their talent. And you look at, you know, as we're, we're coming out of this pandemic and every client I talk to everywhere I travel, there are hiring signs, no matter what the business yeah. is. And, you know, the reality is we can hire warm bodies in and that fits us in the short run but it doesn't help our businesses get to where they need to be. So when I'm talking to HR professionals right now, they're saying, Ed, I'm, I'm so trying to push back on executives that say, just get me bodies in the door because I know it's going to hurt them in the long run. And, and that's a beautiful mindset to have that it's still all about getting the right people on the bus. Right. So, um, so when I, when I look at, at working with folks, it's all about, okay, how do we marry up, the needs of the people in the business with the needs of the business. And if we can get the, the needs of the people met while they're meeting the needs of the business, look out, right? I mean, the, the sky's the limit for a business that can, can make that magic sauce and distribute it out. Yeah. So let's talk about this from a, uh, from a CEO perspective. So, um, you know, I've got this, you know, to say I've got someone on my team that are responsible for HR. Um, let, let's also, I'm sympathetic to a, a smaller business, right? So let's say we have a, you know, director of operations slash HR slash, you know, five <laughs> other positions, which I think yep. we commonly see. Lot. I think we see yeah. a lot of like, you know, uh, you know, someone picking up the HR responsibilities mm -hmm. kind of early how can we uh, begin, uh, you know, early, in, you know, in terms of, you know, valuing and, and creating, you know, pr prioritizing that and, and, you know, and, and having a HR centric organization? Yeah. So it, it, it starts with someone who recognizes that, you know, if you hire in that operations manager, you're hiring in that person because they've got a plethora of experience. They know how to put all the moving cogs of a business together to make it work. So you hire in a finance person because they can do the same thing with numbers and so on, right? Mm -hmm. And yet I'm, I'm always perplexed at why 
we slash out the HR function, right? I will just throw that to somebody else. I mean, in, in today's business environment, forget all the laws and the legal stuff that, that's hard to keep up with. When you look at the changing dynamic of what we're doing, we've got to have someone in there who is, is full-time, head-on, I know what I'm doing with, with how to manage people. And so much of that comes back to how do I develop my talent? You know, it's, it's one thing to get talent in the door, but the re retention of talent is harder than ever these days. And not just because of where we're at with the economy and, and money, but in terms of what today's generation wants out of their workplace. Um, and what we're finding is they want an experience. You think about how the younger generations use social media. That, you know, they're not just putting facts out there. They're experiencing life through Snapchat and Facebook and whatever, you know, other mediums they're using. And, and that's, we're seeing that in the workplace. So the smart businesses today are saying, okay, how do we make work a true experience for our people? One that whether they're making widgets or mowing lawns or whatever, you know, they happen to be doing that it's an experience for them that when they go home, they're saying, I made a difference today. It fits who I am as an individual and I can bring my entire self to work. Again, that, that's what a savvy HR person is going to help you to build. And if you have that work experience, people are going to be pounding on your door to get in. Yeah. How do we hire? Uh, if someone's like, okay, well, you know, we've been kind of, you know, and again, I'm thinking of the business owner that's, mm -hmm. you know, but just been just kind of treating it like, a, well, you know, someone again with five other hats or whatever. And I'll, you know what? We're going to start, we're, we're going to tap someone. And this is, we're, we're at that stage now business-wise where I need someone, this needs to be their sole focus. Um, how do we hire well for that position? I think there's there's two routes. So uh, I'll give you an example. There's a, a client I'm working with right now, $100 million distribution firm. They have a part-time HR person. <laughs> I don't know how they've gotten as big as they are with a part-time HR person. <laughs> she happens to be the daughter of one of the owners. Mm. And so when I met her, what I found is she's a smart gal. She has some operations background from the things that they've done with the business. And so I've been working on mentoring her and, and bringing her up to speed from a, an HR best practice standpoint. And so one of the things I say is, why don't you look at who you have in-house first before we look to the outside? And, and here's why I believe that. I started my career in operations. And I think that those several years of ops experience where you're out there on the front lines with the people making the widgets, that is invaluable to an HR person. And when you really understand how your business makes money, you can be much more successful. Now, if you have to go to the outside route, um, one of the things that I always push back with, with my clients on is don't feel like you have to stay in your industry. Find the person who has had success in whatever industry they've previously been in. Because if they've experienced success, they can replicate that. So let's not get hung mm -hmm. up on, oh, well, we are a warehouse that I had an owner one time tell me, well, I'm a, a plumbing distribution warehouse. I need someone who has been in plumbing supplies distribution. Like, <laughs> really? Come on. <laughs> Good luck finding that. I'm yeah. not sure how to help with that one, right? So, um, so when we're looking at hiring, yes, personality, yes, culture fit, all of those things. But what has that HR person done previously to drive and make an impact in their organization? That's where the line of questioning should really be. And I don't want to hear from the person, oh, well, I got us fully compliant and, you know, I managed OSHA inspections. So what? I get that that stuff's important, but that's not going to drive business success. Mm -mm. Show me the person who solved the most pressing recruiting or retention challenges or who set up a great succession plan knowing that there was going to be a leadership turnover. Those are the kind of, of things that I want in an HR person if I'm hiring them in for, for one of my best clients and saying, hey, this is the person who's going to take you to the next level. What sorts of evolutions have you seen take place over the past five to 10 years that you think are um, maybe we're overdue or you're happy about or you know, or maybe, you know, from the other standpoints, like, listen, uh, I still see organizations that have not caught up. And let me just tell you, over the past five to 10 years, um, 
you, you, you ought to yeah. <laughs> get caught up, yeah. um, you know, in terms of trends. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of things, but I don't want to I don't want to taint your answer on this, but yeah. <laughs> I'll let you take it. So um, unfortunately, I still run into quite a lot of we're scared to make a change because we've always done it this way over here. And when I hear that, I say, okay, but this way over here is costing you a million dollars a year in problems. Why don't you want to fix that? And I actually, I had this scenario with a former client. They said, wait, it's the old thing. The devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. And I said, gosh, um, no, no, it's not. Um, let's, let's take a look from a trending standpoint and say, okay, how do we get our manufacturing environment up to the, the point of what today's graduates want? My, my next door neighbor just graduated from a two-year tech school. People were pounding on her door for her, right? She, she has a CNC programming background now. And the, the place that she chose to go work, she said, Mr. Crow, you could go in there. You could eat off the floor. It was so clean. The machines were impeccably kept. She said, you know, I, you know, I saw some places that were dingy and dirty and no light and it was hot in there or cold or whatever. And she said, I didn't experience any of that. You know, there is an evolution. So how do we take those workplaces that might have that stigma of being not so pleasant to work in and change them around to be, it might be down and dirty work, but we have freshened up the work environment, not just physically and aesthetically, but with the vibe in the work environment so that we're going to draw people in. Yeah. Um, that's the trend that I'm seeing. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, you know, in addition to this, and this is one thing I've heard quite a bit, uh, is that, listen, compensation benefits, yeah, 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 bean bags or whatever. I mean, that's all well and good. But honestly, like, if you really want to connect, particularly with your younger workforce, like, you got to have mission and purpose behind what you're doing. Like, you have to have meaning behind what you're doing here. Um, how do we what, what are some ways that you see that effectively done? Is it just, is it, and, and I'm not talking about just like talking the talk, but you know, walking the walk, like how, what are things that, that you know, the that HR professionals can do to further, you know, again, create, help create that sense of environment, that sense of place, yeah. that, that energy mm -hmm. uh, throughout, you know, the organization, the workplace? Yeah, well, there's something that, that I like to refer to as line of sight. So how can we get each one of our people, regardless of their role, to understand how what they're doing every day connects up to that company's mission and vision and it's hitting its, its key performance indicators, right? And so if HR can create that, can create that storyline for folks, um, and, and the age old thing I like to use is when the boss is out, what happens? Well, business runs and sometimes it runs even more smoothly, right? When the boss is gone, but let the, let the janitor be gone and the toilets back up and the trash cans overflow and it's a cruddy winter day up north and, and there's footprints all over the tile. All of a sudden you, you physically notice the difference between that person being gone, right? And so how can we create that in our people to help them see that what they do matters? Well, that's storytelling. And so, and that starts with the job ads that we place and how we interview folks, how we train folks all of those dots get connected as parts of the story for, for people. And so often HR fails to tell that story to their talent. And then they fail to set up the right, as you mentioned, the right reward structure and everything that's going to support that storytelling. I mean, believe it or not, I, I worked with a call center one time that said they wanted to move to one call resolution. I mean, who doesn't want that, right? When you call the 800 number, you want to tell your problem once and be done with it. And they said, we want that for our customers. But then HR comes in and says, well, we want to motivate our people. We're going to motivate them by paying them a bonus on how many calls they take in an hour. Well, wait a minute. If you're going to bonus me on calls per hour, man, I'm going to snap those calls out because I want my bonus. But that goes in direct uh, conflict with the company's vision of we want one call resolution for our customers. And so not only does the storytelling have to match up, but how we motivate, how we incent our people, how we take care of them has to also match that same mission and vision and, and what we're asking them to do and who we're asking them to be. 
Yeah. Um, you know, one final thing, obviously, is that, uh, you know, you have a lot of uh, employers that, uh, you know, we're, uh, we, we have uh, a lot of our organization team members are now distributed, like they're, they're virtual. And I was talking to one um, director and he's like, you know, I, uh, you know, we, we offer like all this food and stuff, you know, and, and other things to get people just to come in for a meeting. Yeah. And uh, so we started talking. So, you know, how about we all come back to the office? And <laughs> he said that was just met with a bunch of groans and like, no, nah, no, nah, no, nope, don't, yeah. don't want to come back to the office. Uh, it, it, it Talk about the uh, the challenges to distributed work teams, uh, you know, particularly in the sense of, you know, maintaining that culture, that sort of thing. Uh, do, do, any predictions on, you know, what we might see over the next couple of years? I mean, are, are we just the way we are now because folks have just gotten too used to this? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> uh, I, I will tell you this. So in terms of, of prognostications, yeah. uh, several years ago, I was talking about this, this whole idea of remote work and we need to embrace it. And, and I remember uh, being at a conference and being on stage and talking about this and I could see people shaking their heads and I finally stopped my talk and said, what's the problem? I mean, I felt like I was being heckled, right? And this mm-hmm. lady says, I will never embrace remote work because I can't trust that the people are working. And I said, okay, mm-hmm. did you hire these people? She says, yes, I'm the HR manager. I have the final say in all hiring. I said, okay, so what you're telling me is you hire people you can't trust. What's wrong with that picture? All of a sudden, you know, she sat back in her chair like, uh-oh. And, and so here we are, right? The, the bit, most businesses that I've talked to have said they have been more productive in the last year than they've ever been before. So if that's the case, why do we want to force people back under the roof? Now, I also am hearing, especially from younger workers, believe it or not, some of them want to go back because they're missing the social aspect. They're, I'm stuck in my apartment and I got no one to talk to and I want to go back with my coworkers. So, you know, I have always been a believer that within the scope of our business ability, can we give people the things that they want that are going to make a difference? And so, whether it's a Keurig machine in the break room or jeans on, on you know, weekdays or giving them the opportunity to telework or not, mm. as long as they're hitting their goals, what difference does it make? Yeah. And so when you, the, the challenge, as you put it, the second piece of that is from a culture perspective, what is it you know, that we want? Are we trying to force teamwork and that's why we want people in the office? Or maybe teamwork isn't people sitting around the conference room anymore. Maybe it's still just getting the projects out. And as long as you and I can telephonically or computer communicate, we're still, we're still working as a team. So I think the concept of what teamwork means is changing and has changed. And I honestly think it's here to stay. I think we've just taken a, a huge leap in a very short period of time when it comes to distributed work teams. And the bonus of all of this is, man, Think about your, how your talent pool has just expanded now. We've demonstrated that telework works. So why couldn't I hire you when you're down south and I'm up north? And maybe I fly you up once a quarter or something for a meeting you got to attend. But you mm. know, there are a lot of things here that if businesses are smart, they're going to jump on these opportunities rather than saying, oh, well, we're going to go back to the way it was. Well, maybe we're better off now. Yeah, fantastic. Ed, your website, edcrow.com, when someone goes there, what should they click on? Um, obviously, you've got the books, the book, Strategic <laughs> HR. <laughs> uh, so it's certainly, I would imagine, probably have folks uh, buy that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but can you tell me a little bit more about uh, where, where folks should engage with you? Yeah, sure. So uh, front and center on the homepage, if, if a listener has liked what they've heard and they want to have a quick chat with me, there's a button there. Grab 15 minutes with me. Let's chat. Mm-hmm. Let's see you know, if we can work together and what, what makes sense to problem solve. Um, you can find out a lot about the work that I'm doing currently. Um, I'm very conscious about getting you know, kind of case studies up there of what's working, mm-hmm. in some cases, what's not working. Um, and you'll also... I, Fourth quarter and third quarter tends to be huge conference time. And, and I'm loving the fact live conferences are back, baby. Um, so I'm going to be on the road quite a lot um, speaking at conferences. So uh, you can find out my conference schedule. And if I'm in your area, uh, stop by. I would love, love to meet folks. Yeah, it's fantastic. Edcrow.com, E-D, 
K-R-O-W.com. Ed, this has been fantastic. Thanks so much for the conversation. Hey, it's been a pleasure, Josh. Thanks for having me.